Welcome to the Women in Vinyl podcast with Jen DiEugenio, founder of Women in Vinyl and contributor Robin Raymond. This podcast facilitates conversations with those working in the vinyl record industry to educate, demystify, and diversify the vinyl community. Thanks for listening to episode 34 of the Women in Vinyl podcast. You just heard Sinner Not Saint by Fleabops off their record, Get In, Sit Down, Shut Up, Hold On. A rockabilly fun time. Huge thanks to the band, Vinyl Lux, and friend Wendy LeBeau for the use of the song. Check out www.vinylux.com for more. Today we're joined by Cheryl Pavelski, two-time Grammy award-winning producer and co-founder of Omnivore Recordings. With more than 30 years in the industry, she has been entrusted with preserving, curating, and championing some of music's greatest legacies. Cheryl has held positions at Rhino Entertainment, Concord Music Group, and EMI Capital Records, and has produced or supervised recordings, reissues, and box sets for a diverse array of artists, including Wilco, Aretha Franklin, Big Star, Miles Davis, Otis Redding, Willie Nelson, John Coltrane, and many more. Cheryl, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> hey, hello. So for those that don't know, can you tell our listeners a little bit about you and how you got into this industry? Ooh, um, in the Wayback Machine. The Wayback Machine. Well, you know, what I always tell folks uh, is that I was kind of hardwired from when I was very small. I mean, everything about music, about how it's made, about how it comes to us. Um, you know, I don't know. I just loved records from the time I was, uh, as far as I can remember. I, you know, um, I was always bothering my my grandmas because they were the easy marks, right? <laughs> I, was always, I was always after them to, to buy me records. And finally, one of them, uh, she worked at Gimbel's, which was a department store, and she capitulated. And um, and I ran over and I, I had these two 45s, which I still have. And yes. um, she said I could buy, I, I, I said I would buy you a record, not two. And I'm like, come on, this is a really great song. And, <laughs> and I don't even remember how old I was. All I remember is they used to set me up on the uh, counter, you know, like the jewelry counter with the lights in it. So my butt would get hot. <laughs> and I, I don't know. Great memories. Anyway, she, um, she wound up uh, uh, buying both of them. And, and uh, she told my mom that one was for her and I was just keeping it for her. My so, grandma did the same damn thing. <laughs> grandmas are the best. So, yes. um, you know, this the kind of work I do um, isn't represented anywhere, especially if you talk about a woman in the business. Uh, I think it's like me and Terry Landy at ADCO are really... Yeah. The, yeah. the folks that have uh, had lady parts that have worked at the majors and done actual <laughs> catalog work, you know? Yeah. So um, Terry's kept awesome. The dream, kept the dream alive. Yeah. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, um, I just worked my way to it, you know, uh, cause there was really um, no representation of uh, female record producers at all. Um, much less ones that, you know, go looking around through dusty vaults. So, um, you know, in college, I uh, started working at um, the radio station and the television station. And that's sort of when everything kind of came together because I started producing things, right? right. You had to pull disparate parts in to make something new. Right. Um, and then uh, promptly after college, I quit uh, a nice 
job I got and worked at a record store because <laughs> I needed to know, I felt I needed to know more about distribution. And um, then I just, you know, it, it also dawned on me, I'm from Milwaukee, that you had to go to where the business was. And I didn't want to live in Nashville and New York was too expensive as was London. Um, and I had friends in LA and it was much easier to be poor there. So I got to LA and um, back then you could sign up at temp agencies and specify what kind of work you wanted to do. Oh. And I said, only music. Okay. And the beautiful thing at the time was Capitol Records uh, had what they called the floater pool. And they had 20 to 30 people in the floater pool. And, but you had to promise to only work, be available to Capitol. So some weeks you might not work at all. Yeah. Um, and some weeks you got in there and they said, oh, somebody's going on vacation for three weeks. You're going to work in marketing this week or you're going to, you know, and, and they moved you around the tower so that you got to know everybody. Everybody got to know you. You got to know how it worked. And when there was an entry level position, you were up for it because they're like, oh, we it. love her. She's wicked. That's yeah. kind of awesome. Yeah, it that's was, amazing. It was brilliant. And um, the people that I was a floater with, uh, you know, we all like own companies or our SVPs at labels now and stuff. And it's, it was, it was remarkable. Um, and I think it's because the guy who was the president at the time, he came out of the mailroom at Warner's, right. you know, so he understood that bottom up sort of thing. So oh, really? anyway, I spent 12 years of my young life there. Uh, in 2002, they blew out 1800 people in one day. So I didn't take it personally, but I was frankly devastated because Capital was a great label, you know? So anyway, so I I, um, I sat out for a while. I finished some projects uh, um, for Capital and I consulted a bit. I did, finished up the band box set, you know, I was working on Amazing. It, and it was cool. And, um, and you know, I kept, I, I kept telling my wife, I'm like, I don't know, I should maybe start a label because I don't know. But I also realized I didn't know enough at the time, right? I'd been in one place and um, I knew enough to know I didn't know enough. So, um, but I, I kind of didn't want to go back into the corporate side of things. But then Concord called because they had acquired Fantasy. And with Fantasy came all of their legacy labels, Riverside, Prestige, Milestone, uh, stacks, specialty, you know, fantasy itself. Mm -hmm. And um, it was too much. I couldn't take it. <laughs> you know, I didn't even catalog help and I was damn well going to do it. Yeah. So, um, so I went over there and it was, it was really awesome to work with uh, some of that material. I got to um, meet extraordinary people and I started uh, working in Memphis a lot, which has been a really important part of, of my uh, music and, and vinyl life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but the stack stuff was just outstanding. I started working on big star things. That was all amazing. But then Rhino called and, um, they needed a head of A&R so, and, and the commute was better. And, you know, at the time it was still like playing center field for the Yankees. So I'm like, uh, go to Rhino, you know? So oh, I did that for three years and then they blew up Rhino. And then, th then I was like, that's it that's it. I'm starting my own company because I just can't, I can't with this. You know, I'm a person that likes to build things. I don't yeah. like starting over. It makes me yeah. crazy. So, um, so I've had omnivore recordings with my partners for 12 years. We've put out North of 500 releases. Wow. And um, I, I talk about my, uh, my, my vinyl life is still in Memphis. I, I cut for a long time at Ardent with Larry Nix. Oh, wow. Um, but um, when Larry retired, um, I started cutting with Jeff Powell at Philip. And, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate also to work with Michael Graves, who is not a, a, a vinyl engineer, but he's a restoration guy. Nice. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, we can we can pretty much take anything off of any media ever. <laughs> yeah. 
And um, which is great because, you know, I've been able, because of Mike, I've been able to make records that um, before would just go on the dust heap of history. <laughs> you know, um, we've, we've literally pulled things back from the jaws of death. <laughs> well, and was, was that sort of the impetus to start Omnivore was like to do that or what was sort of the goal in creating it? Well, you know, I, uh, I didn't know Mike when we started Omnivore. Um, the impetus behind it was really to um, continue doing historical work. All, all four omnivores, uh, the, the partners, um, they, they've all been in the business even longer than me. I mean, and they have a deep bench of knowledge. You know, Brad comes from um, the publishing side and sync licensing. Greg has long, I mean, he's a photographer and a designer, but um, he's he's shot and designed like album covers, you know, like, uh, the uh, Lucinda Williams one where she's sitting on the porch. Mm -hmm. That's I think that was I think she says that was her first professional photo shoot, and that's Greg. That's my <laughs> um, He's the best to work with. I always I know I've told you guys that, but he really is like always so organized. Everything oh, yeah. is just as you well, need it. I was just like, can everyone be like you? <laughs> well, we have to be efficient because there's only <laughs> six of us, you know, and. Uh, so, and then, and Dutch has been everywhere too. He heads up sales and stuff. So, you know, we, we love historical music. We love catalog stuff. We love telling stories. Um, we love adding a page or sometimes a chapter to an artist's story, um, you know, surprising people with things that they didn't know existed. You know, so the first um, Grammy we won was for a Hank Williams recordings from 1950 that even his daughter wasn't aware of oh, wow. <laughs> um, but that she could you know she claimed she owns she owns those recordings and and so um and you know thankfully i i had mike because we were working from uh the original transcription discs that were found and um it's like you know hank recorded today you know it's beautiful Amazing. so wow. That's um, awesome. so we just wanted to keep doing the work that we love to do and got you know, I mean, the business has been contracting yeah. and um, the focus has been on, you know, TikTok. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like, we don't care. We just don't care, you know, <laughs> we just don't care. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm glad that there's people out there fighting the good analog fight, like restoring and making these historical items readily available to all of us. Yeah. Still. I because it's, hey, it's I agree it's and I, you know I mean, we're, we're getting into a time now where it's like I, we were just talking about Yankee Hotel Foxtrot it kind of straddles you know I had everything mm -hmm. from uh the analog multis to mini discs and CDRs <laughs> now awesome. and it is <laughs> you know and and there's only so much you can do uh with mini disc audio, <laughs> you know, there's, there's only so much you can do to save it, but you know, uh, that was in the capable hands of Bob Ludwig. So, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. How do you decide on what you all put out? Because you do some jazz stuff, you know, we talked about Wilco, um, we put in the fastball record. So yeah. <laughs> well, and, Hank, I, and then Hank Williams. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Remember, you have to remember, I still consult. So, so my Wilco work is for Wilco, and um, this particular record was with none such. Okay. You know, and um, you know, I'll, I've just been around so long that you know, I I'm I'm always happy to consult and work with another label or an estate or an artist. Yeah. Makes nothing makes me happier, right? Um, but with with Omnivore, you know, if you think about it, you know, I've been curating records my whole career it's a little bit more fun to curate a whole label <laughs> all right it's like a giant record yeah, <laughs> yeah. um so you know it, given the opportunity you know and i mean all of us have input all of us have creative input but i'm i just happen to be the person that, whose job it is to come up with the projects for the most yeah. part um you know there's we call ourselves omnivore for a reason right you know, if it's good and it, there's a story to tell and it's something that we all enjoy, we're going to put it out. And I just, me and my partners happen to like all kinds of music. Yeah. So the other thing, I was very conscious of when we were starting the label, calling it Omnivore and wanting to put out whatever. Um, that was going to be hard to brand. It was going to be hard to market. Uh -huh. And it was going to take some time. 
Um, and I think, you know, we're a dozen years in, people know what we do now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we had to weather that for a while because, you know, a lot of small indie labels like us, they really, um, they specialize in things. Right. You know, so it's easily understood what they do. Um, I I like to think that, I, okay, my, my, <laughs> my goal is to have uh, an army of omnivores that just love music and want to discover new stuff. Yeah. And I know that's asking a lot out of an audience. Um, you know, I always... Um, I don't know. I want I want the smart kids to come over and hang out, but you know it's like. But you know if if we can take a Buck Owens fan and and turn them on to Uncle Walt's band, which was a Austin based band from the seventies, I, I want to make those kind of connections, right? I want I want to I wanna, we, we want to give you some music you maybe never heard before, or heard of before, and and now it's like the coolest thing that you found. It's that discovery that all of us felt when we were kids and we're dialing around the radio in our cars, mm -hmm. and suddenly you heard that thing and it messed you up. Yeah. You know? I yeah, want to make. And then those... the hunt was on. Yeah. 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 I want to make those connections for people. You know, it's a it's a little bit. <laughs> Like I said, it's asking a lot of out of a general audience, but um, slowly but surely, my people are coming. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in a way, it's like all the vinyl clubs, except that, you know, yeah. you're just doing it organically, which is really yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we've ever had anyone on that has worked with estates, or if they have, we haven't talked about it. And I'm curious, and I'm mm -hmm. sure other people are too, how that works. Like, how do you approach it? what kinds of like what kinds of deals are made or or what goes into that well the, the deals are the same as any record deal you know um sometimes there'll be some consultation that happens because they you know uh the, the artist is gone it might be family who have absolutely no idea about the music business and they just have this stuff and they're afraid and they should be because the music business is very, um, it's very complicated. A lot of, there's a lot of moving parts. Just getting some people to understand the difference between the composition that is the publishing mechanical to be paid versus the master use royalty for the actual sound recording. You know, that kind of blows people's brains up a little bit, yeah, um, sure. you know, and, and they'll be like, oh, my mom or did, dad were so amazing. But man, they we never knew anything about that business stuff, you know, so they they need people they can trust, mm -hmm. you know. So um, so sometimes um, I just do some general consulting. Sometimes um, I'll put together a product plan for them. Like I'll do the full court press. I'll go in and I'll look at everything that exists in their storage facility or their basement <laughs> and um and and then do you know I'll, I'll start everything with a giant discography right so i'm going to know everything that came out on what label where all of the unissued material fits in awesome. and then we put together a product plan awesome. if they want to do that so it's um and it just depends you know it can be very um in depth and complicated and can take years or it could just be like I think my dad made this record and I have these other <laughs> tapes here and what do I do? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So um, it's, it's infinitely interesting work. If uh, the people in charge of the estate um, all want the best for the legacy. The music, yeah. 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 It seems like it would be such a great kind of collaborative thing to, to be able to do that for people. It can be. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I am only, only sunshine and rainbows on this podcast, please. I am the <laughs> portrait of diplomacy right here. Yes, you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when you come to a, like a project that you are going to pitch or you're you're kind of pulling together, is it something where you're like, ooh, you make the connection yourself? And you're like, ooh, I just found this thing. What if I do a complete discography and then I find out that nothing has happened in this space for a while and I'm really excited about it. Mm -hmm. Let's make other people excited about it. Yeah, kind of sometimes, sometimes it happens that way. Um, after having been in the business for um, a long time, um, projects come in a million different ways. 
-hmm. It could be managers, attorneys, uh, writers, record collectors. Um, all of them are friends, you know? Um, I, I usually, um, I, I kind of say no for a living because I get pitched so much stuff. Um, and you know, gosh, at any given, I mean, the viability of projects changes over time, right? Yeah. Like yeah. something we could have put out in the nineties, um, may or may not be, um, useful or viable or sellable today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it really, um, somebody said the word organic before everything happens very organically. Um, including all parts of a project. We we did this um, set of the um, jazz pianist Hassan Ibn Ali. Um, there was a Lost Atlantic record that we put out last year and it so inspired a new fan that he painted um, an illustration of Hassan and he sent it to my co-producer and I looked at it and I lost my mind because that became the cover of the record that we put out this year of his solo recordings cool. and there was no you know no way i would have ever known this person ever you know yeah. and it just it just plopped into my inbox one day and i'm like that's that's what my the solo recordings of his son's record looks like right right yeah. like let's go back and ask him if we can make that the cover so it yeah. comes in from everywhere and part of if there is a skill to anything I do it's it's knowing what to pick out of the lineup <laughs> yeah. yeah so I mean, um, we find all the time like saying no is hard yeah so. oh it's terrible I've gotten very good at it yeah and I, it's just and it's no fun yeah you know? but I you know I I can't put out everything that crosses my path and especially, you know, I get pitched a lot of new records and I'm like, I really don't want to mess up your record. You know, like we're a catalog company. Yeah. The audience that's going to buy your record isn't looking at us right now. And, you know, um, and also we just, you know, we don't have the resources we have aren't allocated towards marketing a brand new artist and breaking an artist. I, we just don't have that, you know? Yeah. So um, I say an awful lot of no to that, but, you know, 99 out of 100 times when I tell somebody, I don't want to mess up your record, right? Yeah. They, they're like, oh, I didn't even think of that. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, all because we can make it and put it out and distribute it and have a publicist issue a a uh, press release doesn't mean that I can help you make it successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you need to go someplace where like you're going to be a priority. I'm putting a, you know, a record a week. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. And that's different. It's different because, you know, and I'll take that back. You know, we're, we just put out the new Cow Sills record, mm -hmm. right? Their first record in 30 years. That's A, it's a big story for their audience. Mm -hmm. B, yeah. their audience is kind of a catalog audience. Yeah, totally. And, and um, they're hot to trot. They are out doing all kinds of press and publicity on their own. Mm -hmm. And that was a good fit, mm -hmm. you know? That makes so, sense. Well, I mean, that storyline makes sense for sure, too. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so, um, you know, they, they, they come in every shape and size and form. And, um, you know, as, as much as I and my partners think of things that we want to do is as much as, you know, by half or more, we get stuff pitched to us. Yeah. So with the global environment and appetite for vinyl currently that we're <laughs> in the tidal tsunami wave experiencing mm, so much <laughs> even, fun even down on in, in my end like it's it's bonkers on my end too but yeah. how are you guys navigating that space when you're trying to pull assets together that are going to span 25 years or 30 years and it's tape or it's transcription discs or it's mini discs which could be used for coasters like all of these different formats but you're like okay well we're looking 18 months out just to press these records if we were ready today right how is that cap <laughs> what does that calendar action look like for you like that that boggles my mind and gives me 
Hi. such feelings <laughs> for, for you i don't i don't even know what those feelings really are it's been so unfun and so <laughs> brutal i can't even begin to tell you because yeah you know even when capacity opens up somewhere i may or may not have a deal done where i totally. can get, and, and get things done so um last year i had to backfill with other configurations and I have unfortunately found myself in the same situation uh, for Q1 of next year already. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is layer in some things that some other um, people can help produce so that I can work post record store day sure. next year, because the worst thing that you can do, and we've had to do this um, more than we would like, is pull the configurations apart, right? right? Yeah. So if you, if you put out the CD, everybody goes CDs, uh -huh. you know, um, even though they still sell very well for us. Um, but if you pull that apart from the vinyl, you have, as soon as you drop the press release, people are like, well, where's the vinyl? Yeah. You suck. You know, <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea. I, I suck so hard. <laughs> You're so right. I don't know what I'm doing, you know? <laughs> Meanwhile, you're behind the curtain being like, if you only knew, suckers, your brains yeah. are going to melt in six months. <laughs> I, know. I just tell people, I'm like, yes, it's all my fault. Of course. Right. Me. Just Pandemic, use. you know, blah, supply yeah. chain. It's my fault. It's cool. Right. Your whole garage is filled with uh, pe with pellets, right? You like you're, yeah. yeah, you're holding it uh. all, right? <laughs> I could not, I could not feel yellow, this more. <laughs> especially the yellow that's actually yellow. Yes. How come I own, okay, Jen, how come, <laughs> I, why do I own records that are actually banana yellow and then we order yellow and I get orange? Why? Or like a butterscotch. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I even have translucent yellow and is it yellow just rare the the trans yellow recently i think is awful it's yeah. so ugly yeah i don't know it's like dirty looking i i don't uh, know i don't like it and then i get mad and i take it out on greg because he's the only person i can yell at <laughs> <laughs> i'm like dude this is orange he's like well they said it was yellow i'm like well what do you think he's like i think it's yellow and i'm like you're crazy this is orange <laughs> <laughs> you're like here are the swatches i know <laughs> Yeah. I can get blue, I can get green, I can yeah, I can get red, but mm, the yellows, hmm. yeah, they are lacking. Listen to me, vinyl world. I need <laughs> proper yellow. Yeah. <laughs> Hold that thought. It's time for an Amanda fact. Today we use the term analog to refer to the playback of non-digital sound files meaning usually that you're playing a vinyl record or a tape to hear your music. But that is not actually where the term comes from. Early recordings were made from a mechanical process when a diaphragm attached to a stylus is used to etch a pattern into a carrier. Sound causes vibration within the diaphragm, moving the stylus, thus creating these etched patterns. Playback essentially reversed this process in which the diaphragm amplified the sound wave vibrations coming from the stylus moving along the edges, making these two actions, both playback and recording, analogous to one another. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word analog has been around since the early 1800s, but it isn't actually until 1941 that the term was first used to draw a contrast with digital signal. You all know by now that Robin and I are on opposite ends of the record organizational spectrum, but one thing we do agree on is how fantastic Keppel Design's record dividers and record blocks are. Beautifully handcrafted by expert craftswomen in San Francisco, Keppel dividers are sleek, sophisticated, customizable, and built to last. No matter how you organize, Keppel are the dividers to use. Get $10 off your first order of $85 or more using code WOMENINVINYL at checkout. www.keppeldesign.com. 
That's K-O-E-P-P-E-L design.com. And now back to the episode. I love With it. your time in the industry, what would you say, how has the industry changed for better or worse Ooh. over that time? You know, um, I kind of think for worse, but I want to say that about our entire culture, it's kind of been emptied out um, by really unimaginative people who only prioritize commerce. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that worse music is being made. Um, I think there's extraordinary music being made, but it's not being surfaced for um, the way it used to be uh, to a general public. It's a lot harder for um, great music to connect with a broad audience. And yeah. it's because I kind of feel like, and, and the, this crisscrosses um, a lot of the culture and arts. For me, I just feel like it's a, it's, we've gone to kind of this vacuous place and you've really got to look um, it's it's incumbent upon you to find great art. Sometimes very, very, um, you know, I was just asked the other day, I was at one of my wife's college things and somebody asked me about, um, hey, do you watch The Voice? You know, and I'm like, no, I, 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 I no. I'm like, it's, that's, it's entertainment. And listen, you know, it's music and movies and, and, books to some extent, except you have to read, um, you know, all these, <laughs> these things, you know, they, they, they've, for our lifetimes, they've dropped out of the sky fully formed. You're not supposed to see how the sausage is made. Yes. And, 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 and because it takes away some of the, the mystery of it all, but, you know, here's the one thing I'll say things like about American Idol and the voice and stuff, you know, music has always had a good beat. You could dance to it. So it would rate high on American bandstand. That That's part of what music is for, right? Like we we hold it up and put it on this really ridiculous cultural shelf, shelf sometimes a little bit too much because, you know, you're supposed to be able to play it and, and be mad with it or yes. or sing Dancing Queen at the top of your voice, <laughs> you know? And, yes. and the, that's part of what it's there for. And so... The only thing I can say about you, you know, um, our our business is I I wish it was still trying to surface the absolute best music, mm -hmm. and make money off of that and build legacies the way that it did, yeah. um, but we have to remember that we've only had century and a little bit of recorded sound, yeah. so this is all brand new. You know, we're still finding our way. We're not going to get to see what it's going to be like in 200 years. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I hope, obviously hope for the best for, for our business. Um, you know, but I'm just sort of realistic about where, where we are. And I, you know, I, 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 I wish we tried to hold up the very best and I'm not sure these days that that happens hardly at all hard to write a good pop song and it's hard I mean it's always been really hard to write a really good pop song but then to swim through the waters to get to the top of yeah. all of the pop songs to be the very very best well and so, but somebody has to also invest in people who are the very best right mm -hmm. and, well, and so that's another thing like yeah. you know the the big the big stars of the especially the 70s 80s 90s you know, people dumped millions of dollars into them yeah. so that we kn knew who they were. Yeah. And, and, you know, there, there are some artists these days that I like that they're having millions of dollars poured into them and I'm glad they exist. They're just not my, my ball of twine because, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> uh, because they, they, they're probably um, angled at a, at a younger demographic than I am, but I, I certainly love some of the stuff that they do. Yeah. I just wish there was more of them. Well, and what is something that maybe you've worked on or that is just out right now that was sort of like a, wow, this is awesome. Oh, the Wilco project. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just so, um, I'm, I'm so grateful that they um, trust me with their music mm -hmm. and I'm really proud of the work that I did, but most of all, 
man, it's like Christmas when fans are losing their minds over it. And that, that gives me the most pleasure out of anything that I do is it's like something comes out. It's been deeply meaningful to someone for, you know, in this case, 20 years, mm -hmm. and now I get to blow their minds, you yeah. know, <laughs> and it's just, that's that it, it's, it's just the best. And, um, you know, I, I love it when that's done for me. And there's, there's artists that, you know, are, are some of my favorite artists and don't make, I'm not going to say who they are, but I would love to work with them because I want my mind blown. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I have a, a bit of a musical as existential question for you though. Okay. Uh -huh. With the advent of streaming. Yeah. And the way that composition has changed being that people don't get paid unless they get 30 seconds into a song now streaming. And so now people are front loading songs with like the hook. Uh -huh or the chorus or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that is fundamentally different from how people of a certain generation have grown up and learned to appreciate music. Do you think that that's one of the reasons that maybe some of this music is inaccessible to us mm. or we don't appreciate it correctly? Cause no. it doesn't have the story. And you know what I mean? I've been wrestling with this for the last like six months. Well, I think, um... If you think back to sort of the height of uh, 60s, probably 60s pop and mm -hmm. um, very popular R&B, like yep. Motown and stuff, right? Yep, I love um, Motown. Yeah, but I mean, they get to the hook pretty fast. Pretty in, quick, yeah. In the songs, right? Yep. Or, um, you know, there's there's songs like, you know, I, I think about like, lemon piper's green tambourine right it's just um just listen to the front of that song like you want to know what's coming next right <laughs> so i think that's always sort of been uh you know the carnival barker marketing ploy um mm -hmm. but you know then then we went into album territory right yeah. so yes. fm comes along and you know things get longer and weirder and you know it's it's um it's not like the hits changed all that much. I mean, when you hear like a Casey and the Sunshine Band song, you're in pretty quick, mm -hmm. right? So I don't, I don't know that the song structures have necessarily um, changed that. It is, it is depressing to think. I, you know, this, the sound of records have changed. Yeah, right? you can't make a Black Sabbath record on your computer, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? You can't. Like the sounds aren't there. I don't care how yeah. many plugins you have. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's Agreed. just. So I, I I think I think the disconnect um, is we grew up listening to instruments. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't grow up listening to computers, right? And and so I think you know recording everything in the box with stuff that comes in the box yeah. <laughs> or or yeah. plugins of you know like. I would rather go to Abbey Road and make a record. I don't want yeah. a plug-in that makes it sound like Abbey Road. So I think, yeah. you know, there's there's probably a, a, a sheen, a veneer. Um, there's probably some botanist on everything mm -hmm. that maybe uh, is just a audio disconnect for people. Since we are nearing our, our end, um, Robin, do you want to ask our question? I'm really sad. The I want to keep talking. The loaded question. <laughs> Oh no. It's the hardest, the hardest question. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the, people are always like, oh, already knows. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You save it for last too. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's worse than the desert Island question. No. Oh. oh yeah. I know. <laughs> I designed it this way. <laughs> so <laughs> because of the unique situation and wealth and breadth of knowledge that you have acquired, mm. if you are going to make yourself a seven inch record that you could put anything on the A side and anything on the B side. It's a mind blowing record because you can, you can customize it. What would that record be? Mm. Yeah. We, we don't allow any prep. For okay. But, but what, it, what I need some follow up questions. What sure. is the, what is the purpose of this record's existence? Oh. Uh, just for, for your personal enjoyment. It's like if you if you're gonna put your favorite two songs on a record, so you could just be like, yeah, 
Yeah, no. So um, that's imp <laughs> that's imp that's not possible. But I will tell you. Um, <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> no, See, that, that that's not an answer that exists. Um, it, no. Yeah, it, it's a hard question to answer. I know. Yeah. I know. mine but changes. I, I, we, I, we, I will tell you what my favorite single A side. Uh, well, that's not even true. Yeah, I can't do it. Mm, no, I can. I can give you uh, examples of a bunch of things that I really love. Yeah, great. Yeah, uh, but I I can't do an A and a B side. And you know, I mean, you have to give me like a year, a month. You select <laughs> something that like narrow narrow the the playing field here. But I do love um, uh, the sound of the forty five of the Atco U.S. pressing of. Rock and Roll Woman by Buffalo Springfield. All right, cool. All right. That's um, that's a pretty tight little number. And the other thing about that tune is it's so damn short that you want to just play it all over again. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a good one. Um, As the mighty Henry Rollins would say, a dance batch of jams. Yeah. Yeah. I had a good talk with Henry at Capitol. <gasps> Yeah. Uh, oh, you haven't seen that? It's oh, on the it. um the U Music, You Discover, whatever sound of vinyl universe. Oh, okay. oh, okay. So check it out. I will. We, oh yeah. man, he's super Absolutely. nerded. And we were like, I think we we're in Studio B. It was awesome. Amazing. Um yeah, he's he, fun. He does um, the intro for our podcast. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, well, you can put anything on a record by a Fairport Convention, Sandy Denny or Richard Thompson or Nick Drake. I love Sandy um, Denny. You could put anything on a record for me by television. Oh um, yeah, now we're talking. Then, yeah, but then that open that kind of kicks open the door for all things can craft work, uh, La Dusseldorf, Noy, Michael Roacher, anything he did. Yeah. Um, so you know all kraut world, yeah. but you know simultaneously, <laughs> um, you know there's there's some early John Denver records that I really dig. There's sure. some early Dan Fogelberg rec records that are amazing. Um, you know, I mean, so it's, mm, I mean, <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald, Aretha Franklin, yeah. Nina Simone. Yeah. yeah you know, I, I can't, I can't. <laughs> it, I, that's why I said, it's like, it's one of the no. hardest questions. It's, it's, no, worse. It's, it's worse than the desert Island question because it's one record with two sides. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, I, I get I get asked a lot of stuff like that all the time. And I'm like, mm, there's so much great music. I mean, forget about it. Like, you know, let's <laughs> let's let's talk about African music. You know, let's, uh, it's just it's, yeah. it's yeah. you know, mm -hmm. well, here's the thing. This is this is why uh, I think we're smarter than everybody else. <laughs> the three of us on this conversation, because um, we we work in a field that um, is endless. Right. So the more you learn, the less you know, which is, um, you know, it's 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 a it's a giant conundrum because you'll never you'll never exhaust it, and it's, um, you know, I, I turned my obsession into a profession, and I'm very grateful for that. But um, everybody everybody should be as fortunate as we are 100%. because we yeah. get to we get to splash around in this all day long, and it's um, it's it's awesome. It's a gift. Totally. That, I think that's, that's the perfect way to end. Yeah, that's like, the perfect well, that's right. <laughs> oh, that's that's a that's, that was perfect. That's, <laughs> the mar that's the martini shot right there. It doesn't Ooh. get much better than that. Uh, that's right. I, I can tell I've been doing this a while. <laughs> I love it. I so love it. I, I, I really do wish we could do this like for the next five hours because um, this has been really fun. I'm, I'm yeah. really glad you found me finally. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I started working with you guys, you know, at Furnace, and I just loved working with you and became yes. friends on Facebook. And so yeah. I'm like, I've been meaning to ask. And it's one of those things where it's like, you know, it's like, right, people are right in front of you. But sometimes it's like, you've done so many amazing things that it's weird to say, be like, hey, you want to be on our podcast? No, <laughs> you know? no, 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 no. I love doing this stuff. I, I mean, why wouldn't I want to sit around and talk to you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? That's the that's the best. All right, ladies. All right, Cheryl. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for joining us on the Women in Vinyl podcast.
you can join our ever growing list of sponsors, other record labels, Selector, Koppel Design, Eargasm, Groove Washer, Glowtronics, New Gen Audio, and Vinyl Revolution Record Show. And thanks for sponsoring the show. Um, Hey, as always, you can join our conversation on Instagram or send us a note at media at womeninvinyl.com. Clock us, send us info. If you have a question, yo, we got the answer or we'll find it. We won't lie to you. And check out womeninvinyl.com for past episodes, the store, the job board, and the library of resources. Don't forget to like and subscribe and give us a review on your favorite podcast delivery method. You can also contribute to furthering our mission at patreon.com slash women in vinyl. Hey, guess what? This episode, 45 minutes. You know there was more. You want more? You get more. Go to patreon.com and you can get more. And you'll find all the B-sides, the deep cuts, and the amazing extras, including longer episodes, and contribute to the creation of scholarships and educational opportunities to further the demystification, the infiltration of more women and non-binary identifying humans into the final making space, decreasing those turnaround times every week. Yeah, we love your records. We want you to love them too. Womeninvinyl.com. This episode has been brought to you by Women in Vinyl and Red Spade Records. Thank you for listening. Please remember to subscribe. And you can always contact us directly by visiting www.womeninvinyl.com.